Well, we are still continuing on our Bible series on great Bible events. We still are in the book of Haggai, so if you want to turn to the book of Haggai. You know, the Bible tells us that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And that means that we could accurately say that for too many people in America, they're more committed to professional sports than they are to church. Some statistics, they're a little outdated, but there's some statistics that said in, in 1993, the total attendance of worship services in the U.S. was 5.6 billion. Now that counted everyone that was in church for all, every Sunday every year. 5.6 billion people. While the total attendance at U.S. professional baseball, football, basketball games combined was only 103 million. So that's encouraging a little bit there. Less than 2% of the worship attendance, or for every 100 people who attended church, less than two were at a sporting event. So that's not too bad. But now when you look at the rest of the story, it kind of gives a disproportional story. Contributions to churches for the year totaled $56.7 billion, which is just over $10 per every person per Sunday that they showed up. But the amount spent on professional baseball, football, and basketball totaled $4 billion, which is nearly $40 per person, which is four times per person what was given to churches. And is it any wonder that as we look around at, at some professional sports fans that we call them fanatics? They're more sold out for their teams than many church attenders are for their churches. So how might we change our nation if the church quadrupled its commitment to our cause. If we were going to pay four more times what we give now, how much more could the churches of America accomplish if we were to bring in that kind of, of commitment to God's church that these sports fans seem to pay to their teams? Now, in our series of great Bible events, we started looking last week at the rebuilding of the temple as discussed in Haggai. And our message simply con was simply conveyed that God wants his church to complete the work that he has called them to do. Now is not a time to make excuses for why we're not doing the work. We can't be just doing our own thing. We must join together to fulfill God's plan for his church. You know, last week we saw that Satan cannot destroy the church of Jesus Christ, but he can slow it down. The devil wants to bring the church to a grinding halt simply by making us comfortable. He wants to prevent us from doing the work that God has put before us. He wants us to get our priorities mixed up and focus on the wrong things. And if we're going to rediscover God's priority for our lives, then we need to step out of those comfort zones. Now, I'm not going to continue to re-preach last week's message, but I wanted to make sure we're in the same mindset again, be reminded about a couple things. If we're going to keep God in his rightful place as number one in our life, then we have to do some things that are going to make us uncomfortable. You know, Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We discussed that last week. We talked about making God a priority in our life means that we have to pursue both his kingdom and his righteousness. Not one or the other, but both. Our lives have to be both God-governed, not self-governed, and we have to live by His Spirit, not by our own desires. You know, it's impossible to do those things and remain comfortable. So we're going to take a little deeper look into the book of Haggai, this little small book. It's not very long, but there's a lot of good stuff to be found there. And today I want to move from seeing why God's work is delayed to how God's work can get done. So the title of today's message is, How Can God's Work Get Done? I want us to, uh, as the prophet Haggai spoke God's word to the nation of Israel, God gave the people a three-step action plan, which goes like this. First, there's an assessment, there's an agreement, and then there's some action to be taken. First of all, you must make an assessment of the situation. You know, God calls each and every one of us to make an assessment of our priorities, to make an assessment of our life, to take a look around and see what are we valuing, what are we holding up as important in our life. 
And it's not good for us to simply live with the status quo. If we're to move forward as individuals, if we're to move forward as a church, then the time has come for us to take a careful examination of everything we do and where we place our priorities. An assessment, that means to appraise or evaluate. It's really to judge the worth of something. When we take an assessment of our life and the things that we're doing, we say, are the things that we are doing really valuable? Are they worth our time and our effort? That examination or that assessment can also be thought of as an examination used to measure both the accuracy and the validity of what we are doing. And then we look in our story, we look in Haggai chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, we kind of see uh, God telling them this. Verse 5 of chapter 1 of Haggai says, Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And, ye, and he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. You know, movement from your past to your present and your present to your future is automatic. We, time is going to pass. It's going to continue to go all along and plot along. And unless you happen to pass away, you'll be living in the year 2011 in a short 285 days from now. You know, time just keeps ticking away. We talked about that. That was brought up earlier that, you know, Brother Farron was bringing that up in his uh, devotional this morning that it just seemed like yesterday when he moved to Stephenville. Time passes quickly. Life will inevitably take you from today into tomorrow. There's nothing we can do to stop time and stand still. It's just going to keep on moving forward. However, whatever your future holds for you doesn't just simply materialize by accident. If we want something to be different in our future, then we have to change it intentionally. We have to do something about it. Is our future going to be like our present or will you have changed it? Well, that depends on what we do. Will our church remain just simply as it is now? Are we satisfied to have half full pews or are we going to do something to change it? Are we going to be the church that God has planned for us to be? Are we going to be everything that he wants us to be? The first step toward action is to make an assessment of where you are now. But just a careful examination isn't enough to get the job done. After you assess where you are, then you have to, it has to lead up to an agreement. There has to be an agreement of harmonious unity. To be in one accord, to be fully compatible, to be willing to work together one with another. Haggai 1 chapter uh, verse 7 says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Ye look for much, and lo, it came to little, and when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. You know, God starts out this message by repeating himself, saying, Consider your ways. Consider your ways. Think about what you're doing. Assess what you've been doing. And we're not to just simply make some casual observation, when God says consider it, especially if he says it twice, we should pay attention and we should make a really accurate assessment. And in making that accurate ass assessment, we come to an agreement. You know, an ass assessments are important. You know, right now, uh, Christopher's taking his driver's ed training via the internet. He's, he's working this out, he's logging in. He, he, to get it done, he has to log in and, and go through certain uh, modules and at the end of each section, there's an assessment. And it says you take this assessment and 
Unless you've done well on that assessment, they don't suggest you try and move forward on to the next section. If you don't can't pass the assessment, then they want you to review the previous section so that you know you got it right. Well, why is that? Well, because it doesn't do Christopher any good to move on to something new if he hasn't mastered the previous stuff. And that's true with anything in life. You know, each section in this driver's training is designed to make the most safe driver it can possibly make. And you can't be a safe, responsible driver by jumping behind the wheel before you even understand the proper care and maintenance of a vehicle. And you can't be a safe and responsible driver by jumping on the freeway before you can even manipulate corners in a parking lot. It's a graduated process and you have to take your assessment as you go. And an accurate assessment brings a, an agreement. You know, in, in the training, when you make an accurate assessment, you agree that I'm ready to move on to the next level. When we make an assessment of our life with God, with our relationship with God, and we make an assessment of, of our service to His church, then it has to come to an agreement with God and an agreement with each other and how we're going to move forward in doing His work. Amos 3.3 3 says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? There has to be an agreement. When we agree with each other, then, the only, then and only then are we able to walk together and to move forward in God's work. Nothing of eternal value can be done unless there is an agreement. And we're going to simply remain just as we are, just flowing along with the status quo unless we are willing to agree with God and do it His way. You know, regardless of where you are in your relationship with Christ, it doesn't matter where you are, whether you're saved, whether you're lukewarm, whether you're a non-believer, nothing in your life changes until you're uh, willing to agree with God's assessment about your life. You can't move past where you are without agreeing with God and His assessment on your life. You know, Satan, he'd prefer us to simply be comfortable in our sin. He wants us to just be okay with it. It's okay. I'm okay. You're okay. He wants you to believe it when, when you look around at others and he wants you to believe that they're worse than I am, so I'm okay. I'm not that bad. I, when I compare myself to everybody else, I, I do pretty good things. And that's what Satan wants you to believe. He wants you to simply believe that you're just okay. But what does God have to say about that? Where does God stand in, in the assessment of your life? Is God comparing you to your neighbor? And he's he just looking at you and saying, well, how does, how does Brother Joe compare to his new neighbor that just moved in? Is that how God weighs my goodness? No, I don't think so. Isaiah 1.18 says, come now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. My sins are just as scarlet and just as red as anybody else's, but by the blood of Jesus Christ, they are white as snow. They are made to be wool. God says, He says, let's just let's talk things over here. Let's come to an agreement about your sin. And only when we agree with God is He able to then to do a work in our lives. Now, do you remember our number one priority? As Matthew put it, is for His kingdom and His righteousness. And only as we agree with God can Jesus be in us. And only then can He in turn be seen through us. Everything that God wants to do in us and through us, both individually and as a church, is impossible until we agree with God. So where are we going as a church? Where are we going as individuals? Where is our relationship going? What is God's direction for us to walk together in agreement with Him? You know, there once was an African proverb that says, The man who tries to walk two roads will split his pants. And as a church, there are several things that we should hold ourselves to. I believe that God has a plan for every church. And I believe that God's plan for every church, for every true church of Jesus Christ, has some certain core values that must be visible within the walls of that church. First of all, I think every true church should demonstrate that it, has, that it loves God. 
The love of God should be expressed in the church through, through praise, through worship, through prayer, through meditation, through Bible study. I believe every true church should show a love for people. You know, there should be meaningful relationships within the church. There should be a uh, desire to serve and to welcome others into the, into the fold of God's church. Every true church should have evangelism as part of its goals. We should be bringing our families. Most, we definitely need to bring our families, but we also need to bring our friends and our neighbors and all those that we come in contact with. We need to share the gospel with them. We need to evangelize to this community around ourselves. Once we do that, the next step is there needs to be some discipleship. Once we get people in and we teach them about the love of Jesus Christ and we, we get them to have a relationship with Christ through their faith, we now need to teach them a little bit more. There's more to it than that. Yeah. Teaching obedience to the Word of God in order that we might be all mature Christians. That we can go out and continue on with these things. There also should be generosity shown through God's church. We need to give of our time and our talents and our treasures because all that stuff really belongs to Christ anyways. And a, a true church should be very family friendly. You know, God established the family first with, with Adam and Eve. The family was one of the first things established on this earth. And therefore, a church should minister to the entire family. And lastly, a, a church, Christ church, should be committed to excellence. Everything that we do should be done for the glory of God. I think few, if any of us, would be willing to argue any of those values. You know, each of them has a biblical foundation behind it. You know, one could think that we, and in so, in so saying, one could think that we have an agreement on these and can move, move on then to action. But we have to look deeper than just on the surface of each one of these points. It's not good enough to say that we agree with one another on these things, or to even say that we agree with God on these things. But our values are more important than what we say because our values are really what are demonstrated in what we do. So an accurate assessment of our values does not just consider if they are biblical or not. A truthful examination looks beyond what we say is important. It looks at our actions. So our values are shown by our behavior. I'm sure all of us have heard the fact that you know actions speak louder than words. So it's time for an honest assessment that will bring us into an agreement with God and an agreement with each other. So if we say that we value loving God, do we follow that up with prayer and Bible studies in our own homes? If we say that we value loving people, do we back that up with forgiveness? Does every guest of this church feel welcome and connected to each other? If we say that we value evangelism, are we reaching out to the people of our community? Or do we think that giving to faith promise is, is enough? Is that doing our part to spread the gospel because we gave some money to faith promise? Or do we actually reach out ourselves to the community? If we say we value discipleship, do we actually interact with one another and, and discuss about how it's, what is proper living according to God's word? Sometimes it seems we're too afraid to admit our faults and admit our shortcomings and to seek accountability to one another. If we say that we value generosity, do we demonstrate that by giving a whole tithe, which is the first 10% of our income? Do we give all of that to God? Do we follow that up then with offerings, which is anything above and beyond our 10%? Do you think we can expect a whole lot if we only share a little? Are we willing to use our time and our talents to improve the ministries of this church? If we say we value family friendly, do we value our children in worship service? Do we, do we interact with them? Do we encourage them through our worship? Do we talk to them about what they learned in Sunday school? Do we talk to them about the sermon after church when we go home? Do we discuss these things with them? If we say that we value a commitment to excellence, do we show that with faithful attendance? Do we prove that by getting here early so that we're here to welcome the visitors when they come? Do we take the time to be prepared for church? It's not just the teachers and the preachers that need to be prepared when they come to church. 
The hearers actually have to be prepared too, to be prepare their own hearts, prepare their own minds to listen and receive the lessons that are coming. Yes, our actions really do speak louder than our words. And an accurate assessment should bring us to a place of agreement, a place of agreement with God and a place of agreement with each other. And once you have an accurate assessment and you've reached an agreement, then it's time for some action. And action is really where God's work gets done. You know that with God, when you're doing His work, nothing is impossible. If we've actually made an honest assessment and we've agreed with God where He would want us to go, then whatever it is He's asking us to do is not impossible. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 19, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. So when we agree, action brings forth accomplishment. Haggai, verse 12 of this chapter says, Then Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel and Joshua the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai the Lord's messenger in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. In the fourth and twentieth day of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. We see how Guy had challenged God's people to make an honest evaluation of their situation. They t were able to take God's assessment, but Haggai wouldn't let them stop with just the assessment. He wanted them to move forward and do something about it. It wasn't good enough for everyone to have their own opinion. Haggai called on the people to agree on what God had asked them to do. And that accurate assessment produced the agreement which brought forth the action for these people. There's three things in closing that I want you to take to heart. I want you to look at really closely in these verses that we just read. If we overlook these simple statements made at the close of this chapter of Haggai, then we're going to miss out on what God wants to do in us and through us. First of all, what I want you to notice is where Haggai says that the people obeyed the voice of the Lord. So what is the obedience of the people? Well, we might say that it was simply the building of the temple, but that's only part of obeying the voice of the Lord. The obedience of the people began when they listened to God's word to assess their priorities. God first told them, he said, consider your ways. And if they didn't start there, then they couldn't have moved forward to building the temple. If the people had not made that assessment, then they couldn't have agreed with God and nothing would have ever happened. The action of building the temple was the visible or the external part of their obedience. But the invisible or the internal part had to happen first. They first had to listen to God. And before the people could move forward with action, letting God work through them, they first had to let God work in them. And as a church, we cannot overlook God's call to assess our priorities and come to a place of agreement. You know, in the years to come, when people can see the visible result of our obedience, we can remind them that before God was able to work through us, we first had to let Him work in us. Now secondly, Haggai says, the people did fear before the Lord. Now Haggai is not telling us that the people were afraid of God. That's not what he's saying here. He's also not saying that the people were just in awe of the Lord. Haggai shows us that 
The fear of the Lord is a life of obedience. And only as you obey God have you really come to fear the Lord. Your awe and reverence for God is not developed through worship, but it is developed through obedience to what God has asked you to do. And finally, I believe, and probably most importantly for us to understand, look at the last statement, which is God's statement here in the book of Haggai, where it says, I am with you, saith the Lord. You know, God was with His people as they fulfilled His plan and His purpose. God was with them. The Bible says, draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh unto you. You know, God is ready to respond to every action we make towards Him. If we take a step towards Him, He's there and He's ready. He's ready to help us out. Now don't miss this, because God is not just announcing that His presence will be with the people. God is saying to them, I am with you to direct you. I'm with you to empower you. I'm with you to help you along every step of the way. We don't do God's work in our own strength. When we do God's work, that is God actively working through us. And it's His strength. Romans 11.36 says, For of Him and through Him and to Him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Of Him, Jesus is the source. We are His church. We are empowered by His Spirit. He is the creator who gives us life. And without him, we can do nothing. It is of him. Through him, Jesus is the agency or the authority for the church. He's the one who commissioned the church. It was by his word. His, he set it up. And through him, all things are sustained. And to him, Jesus is the goal. That should be our goal for everything. Should be, everything should be done unto Him. Jesus is the reason. He is the motive behind everything that we should do. Jesus is the goal for all of our life. To Him be the glory forever. As it said in Romans. Amen. That means there's, not much more, there's nothing more you can say on the subject. It's, amen. It's done. Through the prophet Haggai, we can again hear the voice of the Lord. You know, God calls out to his people. As we read and study the book of Haggai, we can see God is saying that there is a work to be done. There's something that you can do. So may we, like the nation of Israel, hear God's call to assess our priorities. Maybe we can consider our ways. And may we make an accurate assessment that brings us to an agreement with God about what we should be doing. Make an agreement with God. Make an agreement one with another that we can move forward and take action to do God's work. And that's what God wants for us today. He wants us to be willing and ready. He's not asking you to be able because He is able. He just wants you to be willing and ready to do the work that he asks you to do. Let's stand and we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer.